This conference will now be recorded. Yeah, so we can record it and then um, I think we would be able to share it with you. I'm not sure, but we could probably, our PR, PR person probably could get it up on YouTube or something somehow, maybe. Okay. That's great. Okay, good. Um, I guess we'll wait just a few more minutes just to see if other people join in, you know, maybe a couple minutes, a minute or two after six or something. Oh, yeah. We have to remember, you know, not all guests are Johnstown people who are there five minutes early, you know. Right. <laughs> Although, yeah. look at all the Marylanders here 20 minutes early. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. Yes, a lot of people join late, so. <laughs> I see somebody I know. Hi, Bethany. Where's Zoe? Turn your mic on, honey. There, somebody just that looks like uh, Nella. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's three symbols one for microphone, for meeting, unmuting, one for video. You should see the mic, the screen, and the video camera. So if you just hit the mic, it'll go green. Now, now you pause. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Usually she's my IT person, so I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to look. <laughs> I'm usually ah, terrible at it. Yeah, I'm looking at my organizer thing here. Maybe I can turn it on. So if I'm oh, there, telling stories about you while you're There? No? Yeah, I see both of them are green now. No? Yeah, yeah Bethany, you're good. Okay. Yeah. I see you got I was telling everybody that usually you're my IT person, so I would have no idea why you weren't able to <laughs> get it all set up. I don't know. Is there any way yeah. I can see everybody? I can only see five people. Um, I think because we, we, have, we, have, we have a screen the presenter on. The thing in the center has, yeah, the fa yeah. Facebook page. Yeah, so we're like in a, a gallery form. At the top. Okay. Yeah. But uh, so when we start, I'm just going to mute everybody just so we don't get any um, you know, feedback or interference. But uh, Paul, do you want to just have me also turn off the webcams, or do you want people to everybody to see each other? Um, I think it's neat for people to see each other, and I think my my mother would like to be able to still see people. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and like I said, what I'll do is surprise on here as she's talking about things. If there's a picture I think that'll go well with it, I'll go and find that picture and throw it up briefly and then come back. You know, okay. So I'll operate that. Oh, Joe Kefley has arrived. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> I don't see him yet. I just saw that he arrived. Yeah. Probably. Oh, yeah. All right. There it is. So I don't. Yeah, we're only seeing. Yeah, we're only seeing six, six or seven. Ah, here we go. Maybe they're coming in. Here comes Joe. Oh Lord. Hi Joe. Hello. Hi Joe. Huh? He said hello. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. What? <laughs> Smack, smack him, Mrs. Newman. <laughs> it's been a long time since you've been here. I know. Uh, a long time since anybody's been here. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I sure. <laughs> I don't know. March since I've seen my grandchildren. Damn, it's been March since I've seen no, February since I saw Jason. Jason and Ruby. Somebody <laughs> <laughs> and they popped out. So do you just want to wait a minute or two or we get started?
Yeah, why don't we wait just, let's say right now it's exactly, excuse me, exactly 6 o'clock, uh, 6.01. Okay. So let's maybe give it one minute, and then if anybody joins late, they join late. But that way we right. get people. In there. My sister is here from Myrtle Beach. She's, oh great! She's she's listed as a web a web viewer, so she's watching, but she's not the she doesn't have her face up. Right. But she's watching. Okay. Hey Larissa, is there a button I can click to see the list of people? Uh yeah, there should be. Um, there should be a uh, um. There's okay. a picture with three heads, with two or three heads there. If you push that, it gives you a list. Yeah. yeah. Next to the, a, by the camera and like the microphone. One that says everyone. There should be like 19 people. Yeah. Yeah, I've got view everyone, but yet I'm only seeing a few. So I'm not oh. sure. Yeah, there should be like a an attendees list. There are like a, you know, it's like... Claire said, like a little icon. I can't get any audio here. What am I doing wrong? We've got about 15 people oh, okay, online. Larissa. What? About 15 people on my list. Okay. Yeah. I, I see 19 now. 19. Ann Brewer, okay. Bethany, caller one, Thermine Diana Haddle. Thank you to Deanna Haddle for, and the AEW for purchasing the books. Georgia Yeager, Greg and Carol, Joe Hefley. Hefley. Jackie, Joseph, uh, Joyce, Patty Kawani, Tyra and Forrest, and us, and Pam Weaver, Pat Bergman, Thomas Crowley, and Linda Wigan. So I think we are 602. I think we're going to good to start, Larissa. So it's your show. Take it away. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to to mute everyone here except for uh, for us. So let me, I'll just do that. And then there'll be questions and answers later. Great. Give me a list of people that she had on her list. Don't side on it. I didn't hear your name. So if I wanted to say something, I can, but I don't know whether that can be. That's all right. We won't get in. Almost ready, Larissa? Okay. Okay. I think everyone is uh, muted. Okay. Well, uh, my name is uh, Larissa Duncan. I am a reference librarian at the Cambry County Library. And we're uh, very pleased to have this presentation this evening, this book talk about uh, making do in World War II. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Paul Newman from UPJ and his mother, uh, Margaret Newman, and they are in Virginia at the moment. And so um, we're just going to uh, just ask some questions here and then we'll just start the conversation that way. And then after we're finished, We'll have some questions and answers uh, session for them. So uh, welcome everyone. And uh, so we'll just start with the first question. And the first question: um, Could you discuss the writing process of the book that you know you, you the two of you went through to create the, the book? You want me to start, or you want to start? I can start. Um, I have listened to this woman talk for 52 years, and uh, and. She talks in stories. And so as a child growing up, she would relate to me and my childhood through stories of her childhood. And the stories of her childhood were bound up in the stories of her father uh, and well, her whole family, but particularly her father, who was a, um, a secret, member of the Secret Service, a, a clothed White House police officer um, from 1933, 1932 until 1946. Um, and so there's stories about him and the family on Baltimore Road in Rockville, Maryland. Um, stories about the White House, because she spent a lot of time there as a child. And then a ton of stories about um, being a child during the Second World War. And so I heard all these stories, heard all these stories, and I was enamored by them. It's, it's what uh, led me to be interested in history, was listening to these kinds of stories. And I heard them for years. And I guess about 
seven or eight years ago, we were eating dinner here, Thanksgiving or Easter or Christmas or something. And she was rattling off one of these stories and both of my children, Forrest and Leo were here and they were amazed by some of these things. And I said, you know, to me, they were the same old stories I heard a million times. And um, so I said, you know what, maybe we, ought to, maybe we ought to write some of these things down. And so I started giving her homework assignments. I said, why don't you go ahead and write some of these stories down and, and the next time we come you can read them at dinner time so the next holiday came and she had a handful of these stories and, and she read a few of them and we all had a great time with it um, and that's when I realized that there was something to this so I started giving her more homework assignments and I gave her um, subjects to write about I, I gave her subjects that dealt with her uh, life as a child um, in the 1930s uh, until she was seven eight nine years old and then a series of subjects to write about, about her childhood during the war years. And so I'd say, all right, write about uh, conservation or write about scrap metal drives or write about uh, uh, anything that happened with um, uh, uh, civil defense or write about the movies, write about entertainment, write about holidays, write about food, write about, you know, just kept giving her these little cues. And so it would uh, generate memories and then she would, embellish these into large or into essays about I don't know, 250 to 500 word essays and um, we ended up I'm going to show you a picture we ended up with 67 if I can find it uh, of these essays so of course it's not showing up I don't see it I had the picture oh there it is. there's here it's right here Oops. Shoot. hang on hang on I had it and lost it there so this is a picture of mom holding 67 pieces of paper, or maybe more, uh, with these little essays. So she gave me the essays, and, and I took them home. Every time I came, I collected them, took them back home, and I'd scribble all over them, and I'd write questions that I had, because it always engendered more questions than me. And I learned a lot, because in telling this, when you tell a story, you tell the story pretty much the same way over and over again. But once she started writing, it brought more memories to her and the stories got uh, more context and more texture and it led me to have more questions. And so I wrote down questions. You can see all the, uh, you know, the scribbles all over. And then I'd come back and I'd interview her and, and then we'd add to it. So, so we did all that and in about 2015, we had a, a big pile and I said, you know what, it's probably time. And so I spent a couple of weeks here in the summer of 2015 you know, making sure that we interviewed and, and, and added context. And then we took a week and organized, organized, organized. Um, and this is what, this is the organization process. So, so what we decided is that we wanted the book, instead of just a collection of 67 uh, individual stories, we wanted to tie them together to make a narrative. So mom wrote the stories individually and then what i did with her is i wove them together into a narrative that was thematically based chapter by chapter and so what we had to do was to make keywords on three by five note cards and put notes on them and attach them to each story every story had a number and so on these cards are numbers and letters um, and what you see is the layout of the book and this is on mom's living room floor right <laughs> So, so we did that, I took a picture of it so that I could have that and then made an outline from it. And then I went home, this was a third week in July and I spent, uh, I think three weeks straight just writing. And what I tried to do was to write in my mother's voice um, as a 12 year old. Um, I had this image in my mind, you know, and that's mom at 12 in 1944, 1945, 1944, um, and that's, kind of the voice that I wanted to use um, to write in as her voice. So it's really, the project was one, it's a family history project, um, but it's also a, um, a straight up history project, a, a literary project. You know, we were hoping that, um, that kids would read this book and they have. Um, we've had a couple of schools where uh, children have read the book and so um, one, for example, is in Orange, uh, Virginia, 
which is right down the road. And um, mom went there uh, for a, a whole school presentation last uh, spring of 2019. All the kids in, was it a fifth grade or sixth grade? I can't remember. I, I was uh, middle school, seventh and eighth. Seventh and eighth grade. They all read it. And we went there for, a, I guess it was an hour long or more presentation. Um, whoops, 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 and that's mom with all the kids. Uh, so, so you know, that was the point, and that was really gratifying was to to be able to go and to have that kind of audience. And the the kids really, they really, they, we had actually several pictures like that where they wanted to hug mom and what because they felt like they got to know her through the book. Um, one of them told her a young woman, young girl, told her that my mother was her hero, uh, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, it was a, it was a great project for the two of us to do together because I learned a lot about uh, my mother and the family's history uh, in the project that I didn't know before. After hearing these stories a million times, I thought I knew it all and not even close. So do you want to talk about your experience with it? You know, we had a wonderful time. Paul, pick, pull up the picture of my little boy. Okay. Hugging me. All right at the school where we went, one of the questions that this child that's standing behind me asked, he has, he is uh, autistic. And they wouldn't let him ask a question until right at the very end. And he kept raising his hand and the teacher said, uh, oh, he's autistic. You don't want to uh, get in talking to him. It will take forever. I said, I want to. And, and find out what he wants to ask me. I was very emphatic about it. And so he came over and he asked me a question that I thought was so sweet and so thoughtful. He said, do you miss your childhood? And I answered him and said, for many things I do, for many things I don't. So when we went to the library to have a book signing, he came over behind me and he said, do you mind if I hug you? And I said, I'd love to have a hug from you. But he, he and his sister, he has a twin sister and both of them are autistic children. And uh, his sister doesn't speak at all, but he does. And I think he thinks a lot about what he's going to say too. So that was the highlight of my day there. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Huh? So, so yeah, so it was, um, you know, we really, I mean, if you think about this book, you know, we, we really did write it together. You know, um, she lived it, they gave us the raw material. I kind of stitched it together, but I, I tried to use her words as much as possible so that it's her voice, you know, because that was really what I was going for. Was well, voice. some of the things that I wrote, I had told you over and over again, so you knew what my voice was. Well, yeah, I, I, again, I've been listening to this woman talk for 52 years. <laughs> so well, now, now all of you know why he's such a big mouth. <laughs> yeah. Right. Some things you inherit, you know. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... um. Margaret, do you want to tell us about your family and, and the role that your father played in the White House? Sure. Uh, my father worked, well, he was working in the White House before I was born. But anyhow, <clears throat> when some things I don't remember when I was two and three years old, of course, but I certainly remember hearing about it from everybody. But um, I went there to play with uh, Sissy and Buzzy Dahl, who were uh, President Roosevelt's grandchildren, and um, which was nice, but it didn't mean anything to me, except I was going to go to work with Daddy, and there were children there that I could play with. So I thought that was great. And the picture that uh, Paul has up there now is Buzzy, <laughs> and I um, won, Easter time, Easter, Easter egg roll that we had at the uh, uh, White House always. And uh, Buzzy and I were together a long time before our, this picture was taken. Because 
during their Christmas party one time. I don't know why, but I, if you have read the book, you'll know that I ran across the East Room floor when I saw him and kissed him. Well, he didn't like that apparently. And he hauled off and gave me a sock in the jaw and grandmother Rosewell, Sarah, um, picked him up and spanked him for doing that to me. So we, you know, we played together and whatever, but didn't mean anything to me. And uh, he's gone now. He and his sister both are gone. He just passed a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you still have the scar on your lip from yeah, where you're whacked with the fire truck. Yeah, he hit me with the fire truck one time because <laughs> I, I wanted to play with it. He wanted to play with it. And that was that. So he let me have it then, and I've got a scar on my lip that goes down my chin where I had to get stitched up because of it. But Tell me a little more about um, Gaga and and uh, how he got to the White House um, and maybe some other things about your memories of being yeah. little at the White House. Um, Paul's calling my father Gaga. That's what the children all called him. But anyway, um, my father was a, a metropolitan police policeman from 1922, I think, 22 or 23. Um, and there was a man that was a friend of my grandfather's, Grandfather Magruder, Jesse Magruder, who was a secret serviceman at the White House. I don't know or don't remember what the man's name was. I can see his face now, but I just can't remember what his name was. Anyhow, um, my grandmother did not like the fact that my father was a policeman because it was during prohibition in Washington, D.C., and it was not a nice place to be at that time. Anyhow, whoever this friend of my grandfather's was saw to it that daddy took the exam that they had to take to become a secret service. And um, Daddy went to, while well, he was um, a metropolitan policeman, he went to what they call then night school at George Washington. And that's, he took, I don't know, classes in history and all sorts of things. And I don't remember what the name of the degree was that he got, but it was a, um, a, a Degree. Associate's, Associate's degree. Associate's degree. Anyhow, he passed all the tests and then they did a uh, um, physical test. Well, my father was tall. He was not heavy, but he was. Is there a picture of Gaga in here? Yeah. Um, He's strong. He was a very <laughs> strong person. There, there he is. Well, that doesn't show how tall he Good. is, but he was over six foot. I got another one. Hang on. Um, and um, what role did he play at the White House, Mom? Well, there, there he is. That's he, how yeah, was. that's my mother and father. Yeah. Um, well, what role did he play and how close was he to the president? Well, very close. But anyhow, um, I don't know how he got to be so close, except Daddy was a real people person always and love to be with people and do things for people and whatever. But um, I don't really know how he got to do the things that he did because he took care of the family too, in so many ways. John Roosevelt was the, they called him the baby, but <laughs> the youngest son. And he turned 16 um, sometime before I was born, can't remember, but I remember talking to him on the phone after it was all over. But anyhow, um, later, uh, Daddy took took the job, got the job of teaching him how to drive, because that's what you did then. You didn't have a company that came and taught you. He taught him how to drive, and then he took him to wherever in D.C. to get his driver's license. And somewhere in a scrapbook that Paul has, 
is a picture of all this that I think my grandmother had made this scrapbook for my father. It was all pictures um, that were in the um, Evening Star newspaper at the time. That was the big newspaper that we had in DC, uh, which uh, the Washington Post is comparable to that now. But uh, he did everything and uh, loved doing it, whatever. Um, how, how often did he take you to the White House or how often did you visit as a child and what did you do when you were there? How often I went was quite often. Before I uh, went to school was more often, of course. Um, but, and especially in the summertime, I went more uh, because Sissy and Buzzy, who had a governess at the White House that taught them, they didn't go out, out to uh, a private school or the public schools anyway. Um, I went quite often with daddy and uh, before the war, it was different than after, than during the war. Um, we had the run of the house and we just had fun like children would have. We roller skated sometimes inside the house and sometimes outside on this, it was like a patio thing around uh, along the, um, um, West Wing Colony. Yeah, West Wing <laughs> Colony, and right by the uh, uh, Oval Office at the time. Um, President Roosevelt didn't do as much in the Oval Office as some of our presidents now do because of his uh, infirmity. And he stayed upstairs in the so-called uh, private residence. And that was another place that we played that was so much fun to us anyway. They had, which was probably state of the art doings at the time, they had um, a so-called elevator that was attached to, the way I can remember the thing was attached to a, uh, the railing on steps. And we used to get on there and go up and down, up and down. Yeah. And that was a ride for us. And, you know, I didn't have one of those things in my house. So I thought it was great. And I can remember hearing him yell, you kids, please bring back my ride. <laughs> he wanted to go wherever. And that was the only way that he was able to go. They did have an elevator, but we were never allowed to get in there and uh, used the elevator, but we used this other little thing that was his ride. You and said it was different after the war. What what changed after the war started? Um, after the war started, we weren't allowed to go up and bother him um, like we could before the war when things were not, you know, but we saw so many people coming and going then. It was like the... Um, Oval Office, but it was upstairs where he was, and he didn't have to travel to do anything. But he always had his, the dog sitting in his lap. And uh, I can remember when I got older, let's say older, I was probably seven or eight. That was during the war. Sometime they would tell us, it's OK to go upstairs now, which we knew that he didn't have any visitors or whatever, and we could do what we wanted. And I can remember going up there and we take turns sitting in his lap. I don't know what <laughs> that was all about, but because, well, of course, the three of us couldn't fit, but whatever. And the dog was always there in his lap. And I can remember sitting in his lap and holding the dog. Talk about your trip to Hyde Park. <clears throat> yeah, I went with Daddy um, to Hyde Park when he, well, Daddy went with the president no matter where he went. And um, sometimes I was allowed to come, sometimes I wasn't. And it seems to me that I went when the children were, his grandchildren were always going to be going or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, 
one time, I don't think I even wrote this in the book, we went on a train. And it was apparently a special train for just for him, because there was nobody on there but the uh, family and whatever, and daddy. And that was neat, I thought, uh, to have your own train. Yeah. <laughs> what, what piece of technology did you see for the first time in Hyde Park? Oh, when, in Hyde Park, when I went, and the se second time, it was funny too. The first time, they had a TV and in the living room, and it was two pieces of equipment. The one piece on the bottom was like, you could see glass. I don't know what it was. It was a mirror. But I didn't know that. Yeah. But it um, was on the top part somehow. You could see it. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I ever saw them have on it was a baseball game. But it was so blurry and whatever. <laughs> you, it was, but it was this state of the art thing. And, you know, to hear television, what is television? Yeah. You know? And, uh, but when I went back to uh, visit um, Hyde Park, it was a good while after he had been gone and something happened there that was really, really sad. When he died, Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt inherited the house. And she left it so that whoever got the house after she died would be the park service. So they packed up everything in the house and put it in storage. Nobody <clears throat> thought to catalog where things were, which is was terrible <laughs> to me. And I went in the house and I said, well, this isn't right. That's not right. Piano wasn't there. Television wasn't there. These pictures were in this room, not in that room. And a couple of people that uh, were there that were working at the time, they said, could you come back here and work for us? And I said, well, it would be a quite a, a trip from Rockville to here. So I'd say no. but. I said, it's a shame that somebody didn't take the time. Leave it to historians to completely screw something up. <laughs> Which they did, but that's what it was. So one of them said to me, she said, it was a man. And he said, one of the workers there, he said, what is your name? And I told him, and he said, are you any relation to Forrest Magruder? And I said, yes, how did you know my father? And he, he said, well, if you go downstairs to this, it's like in the basement, you'll see your father. I said, what? And I went down there and it was the map room. And they had made a cardboard cutout of my father in the map room. He worked during the war. There was a a room in the east wing of the White House that was dedicated to updating maps um, every day, all day long. And at one point during the war, he worked in that map room. Uh, uh, today, maps are updated instantly. I mean, it's all satellite and what have you, but these are like paper maps that were constantly being redrawn, re-updated. And he would bring home maps that were declassified, given my mother, and she pasted them on her walls oh. in her bedroom. And, and kind of charted the war as it went along on these official maps and they were huge, you know, the size of the wall. So that, so he's he was part of that map room story. All right, Larissa, why don't you go on and um, give us your next question? Okay, um, so um, Margaret, um, tell us about um, Percy and Carolyn in the neighborhood they lived in Lincoln Park. Um, he asked you to talk about Percy Oh, and and your friend Carolyn um, and and kind of that part of your life growing up in in Rockville. And she wants to know about your neighborhood and about her neighborhood, about 206 and 302. Well, after I was born, my mother was not well at all, and uh, Percy ended up. Um, well, there was one lady that came and stayed at our house, which I never 
knew because she left when I was six months old. Anyway, um, that was Lottie. And Lottie uh, recommended Percy to come take her place. And Percy was my mother, really. She did everything for me. And then when I got to the point where I could remember her, of course, you know, I was like four, I think. And it was like, I never remember not knowing Percy. She was the first person that I knew that took care of me. And of course my grandparents did too, but anyhow, um, I remember her and she had a little girl who was a little bit older than I am. And that was Carolyn. And Percy used to bring Carolyn to work with her sometimes to play with me. And Carolyn and I were good friends forever. And uh, we had a grand time playing and uh, roller skating and skin in our knees and all that kind of thing. But anyhow, um, and then when um, we could, uh, we would went, we went to uh, Ocean City, Maryland in the summertime for a month. And Percy and Carolyn would go with us and uh, would be mother and my brother and when he came in 1938. And my father worked, of course, during the day and he would come on weekends. And also my um, grandparents, my uh, father, my, my mother's parents would come. My grandmother would stay with us. And then my grandfather, who worked for the federal government, he and daddy would drive down and stay for the weekend. And then here's a picture oh, of, sorry. Yeah. of my brother and I. Um, eating candy eating apples. Candy on apples. Boardwalk. <laughs> on the boardwalk. On the boardwalk at Ocean City. And uh, whatever, but There's anyway, another one in Ocean City. yeah, something that I learned um, as my mother and my father and myself. I don't remember who this woman was and this little boy. But that's you there. Right? That, that's me. Yeah. Um, the little boy, I know who he was, but I can't remember the lady's name. But anyway, it, uh, her husband was a friend of my father's. So you were talking about. Um... Percy and Carolyn going with them, Yeah, right? Percy and Carolyn went with us. But they're not in this picture. No. Explain why. They were not in the picture because they were not allowed to go out on the beach with us. They had to go to another beach, which was, I think, a little bit south of Ocean City. Don't remember the name of it. But anyway, Daddy, I can remember going with my father or my grandfather or somebody driving us there because it was a ways away and they would stay and they'd pack a lunch and spend the day there if the weather was good or whatever and uh, that was a puzzlement to me i never understood that at all why because carolyn went everywhere else with me when at that age but then when we got older uh, Carolyn couldn't go with me like to the movies in Rockville. We had one movie theater that was the Milo. And Carolyn would go walk with us up, I say us, my some of my friends, up to uh, the Milo in Rockville in the afternoon, on Saturday afternoon. That was a big thing. And when we got to the theater, I would, this is the way it went. I would buy Carolyn's ticket and mine, and she would have to go to the side entrance that were uh, wooden steps that were way up top in like a balcony, as they called it, mm -hmm. and sit. She couldn't sit with me downstairs. Well, that I didn't, and I couldn't go upstairs. That made no sense at all to me. Yeah. And they had somebody standing at the bottom of the steps, a man usually, and not a policeman, but just somebody. And he wouldn't let me go up with her and she couldn't go in with me. Well, that was the stupidest thing I ever saw. And, and at the time, I can think, well, why? Never thinking that Carolyn was not white. Right. 
Whether you weren't, but well, <laughs> either way, yeah. And Even I, didn't, I didn't understand any of that. Um, let me pull up another picture here. Where there it is. What's that, Mom? That's the house that Carolyn, I don't know if she was born there or not, but um, pretty after. She may have been born there because her grandmother, I know, um, used to be a midwife. So she probably was born there. Um, that's the house where they lived. And I think when I remember and had sense enough to know what was going on, she lived there with her mother, her grandmother, and I think two of her uncles. What were their names? Um, we'll get that in the question and answer. Yeah, yeah. Claudette, Jackie, and uh, Joseph will give us that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I remember yeah. there was one of our brothers that had a car. He worked for three brothers. But anyway, that was what, you know, happened to my thoughts during that time. Never did understand what the story was. And this neighborhood was more or less right behind your neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. And yet that I was could have walked. And that was the segregated neighborhood of, of Rockville. Yeah. I could have yeah. walked. Yeah. yeah. Named for President Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. Ended up being called Lincoln Park. I can't remember the original name, but it ended up being named that later. It's next to Mary. I only I only knew it as Lincoln Park. Yeah. And I lived in Croydon Park, where right. I didn't make any, you know, so it was two different names. That was all I knew. Right. I was not very smart. <laughs> smart enough. <laughs> You're smart enough to know what was right and what was wrong. <laughs> well, I didn't know what was right or wrong. I just didn't under, couldn't understand why they could tell me, no, you can't go up there. Yeah. Um, tell the story real quick. Um, Oh, shoot, her name just went out of my head. Uh, 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 Martha Riley McGruder. Oh. And how she was kind of your hero, family yeah. hero. And I didn't know, never knew the woman. No, she no, was. She was, but you knew the stories. Yeah, Martha Riley uh, was my, I think, great, great, great grandmother. Yeah. And uh, she lived on a farm in um, uh, Montgomery County. She was married to my ancestor. Anyhow, she taught the black children to read and write. And in Maryland, that was a big no-no. It was illegal. Yeah, it was illegal. Yeah. It was and, illegal throughout the 19th century. Yeah. And uh, but she kept on doing it. And what would happen to her? Some of the neighbors would rat out on her, and the sheriff sheriff would come, and she'd get arrested. Well, in Maryland at the time, women could not be put in jail. So you had to either your husband, if you didn't have a husband, it was to be a son or somebody in your family that was a male would have to go to jail for it. Well, her husband did it, I don't know how many times, and then somehow or another he got out of it, and her sons, because she they had a big family, her sons would take over and go to jail for it. It was 30 days. Yeah. yeah. And I could never understand that. Yeah. Well, one really interesting thing about Martha Riley, yeah. um, Martha Riley Magruder, her father was Isaac Riley. And he had a plantation in, in Montgomery County. Uh, his house still stands. It's in Bethesda. You can still visit it today. And there's a cabin out back. And Isaac Riley was the care was the real person um, that Harriet Beecher Stowe used to develop the character uh, in her book Uncle Tom's Cabin. The characters, both characters, Simon Legree, and that's Isaac Riley, who was a, a vicious, awful man, uh, and Uncle Tom. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's and so Martha Riley was his daughter, and so she did a complete 180 from her father. You know, perhaps because of what she saw, um, and so that story, and she married into the Magruder line, and so that story kind of, you know, was a was a big family story, and and you know, we're we're big uh, uh, Martha Riley fans. <laughs> <laughs> Team Martha. <laughs> All right, you got another question there. Yeah. Um, is there a story about the Roosevelts that's a favorite of yours? 
-hmm. a story about the Roosevelts. That's a favorite of yours. Oh, I don't know. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Just I could, one thing that I can remember so vividly is talking to Eleanor Roosevelt. I can remember stand, she was a tall lady too, very tall. Anyhow, she would stand in front of you and hold both of your hands while she was talking to you and asking you questions about what you were doing in school and what I was doing in Girl Scouts and all sorts of things, you know, but I can remember standing there and looking up and thinking she was so tall. And I was thinking too, that she knew so much. How did she get to know so much? And then she would tell me um, things sometimes that she had been doing um, during the war, of course, and before the war, um, the president couldn't travel around the country to do things like she did. And she was his legs, as she called them. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm his, I'm his legs. And uh, it was so gratifying to see all the things that she had seen. And of course, it was during the time, um, 38, 39, when we had the depression here. And so many people that didn't have homes or food or anything. And uh, I can remember her talking to me like that and telling me that I should pray for them. Um, how about um, Sarah Roosevelt, Mom? So just to remind <laughs> people, when, um, when FDR and Eleanor came to the White House, uh, FDR's uh, daughter, um, her marriage had uh, dissipated. And she had two young children. Uh, and so Anna Roosevelt came to live in the White House with Buzzy and Sissy. Uh, Curtis and what was this thing? Something Eleanor. Yeah, um, and came to the White House, and so um, Franklin brought his mother, Sarah, to kind of you know take care of the grandchildren. And so my mother, in going to the White House, became one of Sarah Roosevelt's favorites. So my mom was sick as a kid, had everything you can imagine, but probably one of the worst things was that scarlet fever, I guess. Yeah. Or, or no, what was it? Erysipelas. Erysipelas. That's right. And go ahead and tell that story. Well, that was a story that I was six at the time. And uh, so I remember an awful lot of it. But anyway, I was very sick. And it's an infection of the blood streams. So that was not good news. And that was long before we had penicillin or anything that would help, except we did have the sulfur drug but they had no idea whether it would help or not. But anyhow, um, at first they thought that I had um, smallpox and they had a doctor that came from Johns Hopkins to examine me to see if it was, because if it was, I was gonna have to go to Baltimore uh, to be in a hospital that had a, um, well, it was like an ICU, uh, unit now, but uh, I could be quarantined and whatever. Anyhow, they finally decided, this doctor from uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore decided that it was um, an infection of the bloodstream and it's called erysipelas. Anyhow. Uh, they thought at first that you were horribly contagious and, yeah. and they were keeping people away from you. And, and I'm asking you to tell the story about Sarah coming to the house. Well, to get back to the beginning of the story, guess who stayed with me? Percy. <laughs> yeah. She would not leave me. Yeah. She said, no way. And because she had taken care of me, she said, no way. I can remember hearing her saying no way so many times. But anyway, that's what she said. So she stayed and took care of me. And because uh, that was it. And anyhow, uh, Somebody, I guess it was the doctor from um, Johns Hopkins, had decided that maybe they'd try this new sulfur drug, as they called it, and it was sulfonilamide. I'll never forget the name because they told me the name of it. And, um, but you couldn't go to the drugstore and get it here. 
I don't know where they decided to get it from, except President Roosevelt's doctor, Dr. McIntyre, mm -hmm. found out where he, they could get some of it. So they got it and somebody flown it for you. somebody flew a plane with the thing uh with the stuff in it for me and unfortunately they didn't really know how much to give me the dosage or whatever well it seems as if they gave me enough to kill the horse <laughs> and i turned yellow all over and but in the middle of all that um sarah roosevelt grandmother came to visit me thought she was going to visit me she got to, some of her, her secret service me drive her out to our house and they wouldn't let her in of course and she stayed a member on the front porch it was in the springtime when i had all this and um it was like february that i got sick to start with and then it went on all spring and summer, really. She sat on the front porch and the room that I was in upstairs, I could hear her down there. Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. Grandmother Sarah. Fussing at somebody, I don't know who, might have been Percy, that she needed to go upstairs to see me. And they wouldn't let her. Anyhow, I talked to her. I remember I was in bed. And Percy took, came up and took the bed and pushed it over as far to a window as she could. And I talked to the lady that way. And she told me how sorry she was. Give you a doll. And she had brought me a doll and some doll clothes that um, she'd made. And I had had doll clothes before that that she'd made. So that was not a new thing, but that was. Oh, one more story, Mom. Let me uh, pull up the picture, and you'll know what I'm talking about when I pull the picture up. What about the rabbits? One of the rabbits went to the White House. Well, why are we raising the rabbits? At the, the beginning, beginning of the rabbits, that's Snow White that you can see there. And uh, he was a Belgian hare. And had he was quite large and had beautiful, long, fuzzy-like hair, like a angora hair like thing anyhow we ra i raised him during the war um to shave the rabbit if you can imagine <laughs> shaving a rabbit that was an ordeal but anyway he was pretty good and he didn't you know try to get away and that's not a euphemism for anything she's actually shaved this rabbit <laughs> <laughs> I didn't use it, but a lot of people raised rabbits for that for that uh, during that time. What did they use the they, fur? They used the fur to line the aviators, as we call them, helmets, because their planes were not decompressed or whatever yeah, they called them then. And it was freezing cold for them. So they used the rabbit fur to line their helmet like things that they wore and their jackets and their gloves and everything. So poor old <laughs> um, snowballs, poor old uh, Snow, White. Snow White got shaved. He could be shaved three times in a year. So that's what we did. And uh, so he's part of the war. He was part of the war. And so what's the connection between Snow White and the White House? Okay, Snow White <laughs> had a girlfriend. That was, her hutch was on the other side of this, uh, Anyhow, they had babies every spring. And um, around, you can't see this, but around this area was a big fenced in area where we used to let them run and do whatever. And uh, then we put them in the, uh, what you call the hutch at nighttime to sleep because we filled out with hay. But anyhow, we, do that and we had one man in our area where we live that um would take the hair and he, i can remember seeing him he combed it like and then he put it in big bags and then we'd take it up to the uh 
uh, railroad station and he had an address or whatever they put on the thing with the bag. They were like, well, I remember white bags were heavy. What's the connection between this rabbit and the White House? Let's okay. get to that. But I will need to tell you that <laughs> what they did, how I got there. Anyhow, uh, Snow White and Molly Cottontail had babies. And one year, um, I think Daddy was uh, telling um, Sister and Buzzy's uh, mother about the rabbits, how cute they were, because the baby rabbits were adorable. And uh, we had places that we'd send them to until they were big enough or old enough to get shaved. Anyhow, one of the uh, uh, baby rabbits went to the White House and it was for Easter. And the Easter Bunny brought it to the White House. And uh, Anna Roosevelt Dahl wrote a book about <laughs> the rabbit and it was called the rabbit that came to the White House. Oh, okay. I'll look for it. And uh, so they had one of our rabbits there, and he just ran loose wherever he ever wanted to go. Not I saw him, of course, because he was not in Hawaii. But I don't know what happened to him. What was his name? I'm not, his oh, there it's Scamper. There it is, right there. His name was Scamper. Scamper. So there's the, the book. Oh, I used to see him. Can you see that, Larissa? Um, I could just see Laura. pictures of, of rabbit there. Oh, there, scamper. Yes, I see it now. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that'll bring it. Anyway, there's, so, the, there's the Amazon page. You can still buy it. <laughs> so I used to get the same scamper when I went to the one. Yeah. So uh, what's your next question, Larissa? Okay, well, the uh, final question I have is, um, tell us about your Uncle Crest, uh, his experience during and after the war. Um, he wants to know about Uncle Crest uh, and the war and, uh, you know, his story and his family and your connection to him through the war effort. Yes, well, to begin with, my connection to him was, uh, I was... I think six and a half when my brother was born. And uh, so he wasn't much of a playmate for me or anything. And I lived just well within walking distance of my mother's parents. And they had a son who was only 11 years older than I was. So I was with them so much and with him so much. For a long time, I thought he was my brother. And so we did a lot of things together always. So I was very close to him. Yeah, there he is. And uh, with his yellow mittens and gloves that Mrs. Stevenson had made. Okay. <laughs> That's his wife, Virginia. <laughs> That we called, that I called Jidge. On their wedding day. Yeah. And that's that 42, I guess, right? Christmas no. 43. 41. 41. 41. Oh, that's right. 41. Yeah. Um, and that's Father McHugh, who ended up dying during the war. There was something that him and one of my stories that I wrote. But anyhow, he went in service. Uh, Press and I were always very close. And. Um, Your father, Press and the kid. Yeah. And it was, uh, let me see, let me see, no, I've got a good one. Anyhow, he came, he was um, in school at Georgia Tech, he wanted to be an engineer, which he was, but anyhow, um, he came home at Christmas time, and that, there he is in his airplane, as a child. that I wrote about as a child, and I used that airplane too, during the war as a child, and I shot down German Planes and I Japanese zero method fence. Yeah, yeah. I, I really I think I didn't shot down more than what really. Yeah. But anyhow, um, that was in the front yard. 
But anyhow, he came home uh, from school at Christmas time of 41, and it was right after December 7th, of course. That's you and he yeah. when you were a child. Yeah. And um, what we found out, or my grandfather and my father found out, and they're the ones that decided, um, if you enlisted, you could finish school. If you didn't, you had to go right away, of course, when served. And um, so they decided it would be best for him if he enlisted, which he did. And um, there's his handwriting, which I'll never forget. It was beautiful printing, really. And some of his grand his children, really, I think print like that was somebody not so long ago sent me something that I called him and I said, thank you for whatever you sent me, but I recognize that printing. Anyhow, uh, he, he could not go back to Georgia Tech because they did not have an ROTC program. He had to go to a school that had one. So he was accepted at um, University of Florida which did have a uh, ROTC program and also they had a uh, engineering program. Right. So he got his engineering degree or started to get his engineering degree and he served with the unit in Europe as an engineer. What what famous battle did he uh, serve in and what he happened there? He was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was in Patton's Third Army. But- um, What happens there? Uh, that's where it was during the winter time there, of course, and, freezing weather. Um, he got lost from, he and some others got lost from our own company or whatever. And uh, they were taken in by Germans as prisoners of war. And he always said he knew if he hadn't been captured, he would have frozen to death, which a lot of them did. So what were, what was the family told what did you guys know about him after the, you guys read in the newspaper about how horrible the bulge was yeah. and you lost track of him. And then, he, and then, well, then you got a, didn't you get communication from the army? From the war department. From the war, what did they tell you? That he was missing in action. He was missing in action. And then it was. Well, know, here, so he's missing in action and, and you don't know February, Mar January, February, March, April. And then April, your his father passed away. Yes. Right. Your grandfather, and which made your father stay home when FDR went to Warm Springs. Yeah. And then right. FDR yeah. died at Warm Springs. Yes. And you guys had this terrible April because you lost my uh, grandfather. Your grandfather and the president mm -hmm. within days of each other, and you still didn't know where press where press was. was. Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, the war ends and everybody's happy that the war ends. And right as the war ends, this letter comes in the mail when they still didn't know what happened to him. And it's a letter dated February 13th from Germany. So it's about six weeks after he had been captured. Uh, he spent a couple of weeks with the Germans and they were fleeing back uh, to the, the east to defend Berlin. And they just left their prisoners. And fortunately, he got picked up by Americans and he was uh, put back with his unit and wrote this letter back to my mother and uh, her brother. Um, Mom and Leon had written him a letter uh, probably sometime in December talking about it snowing and Leon not being able to go to school because of the gas rationing and those kinds of things. And so I'm just going to read it so you can hear the letter because it's really interesting. Dear Peg and Leon. I am glad that you two have been able to skate some. We've had plenty of ice and snow, but none to play in. Toots, that's my mother's mother. Um, her, you know, the press was the little brother called her Toots. Toots sent me Peg's picture, rabbits included. That's the picture we just showed you with her and the rabbits. Uh, you were getting to be quite a young lady, Peg. I understand the shortage of fuel is keeping Leon home from school quite a bit. It was never like that for us. Um, Mom and Press both went to school across the street uh, at uh, Park Street Elementary School and they could just walk. Leon was sent to a school that he had to get bus to up in Gaithersburg and so he can only go a couple days a week. There is a movie tonight 
and 75 men from E Company can go. It seemed strange going to the movies and hearing the guns pounding away nearby. So he was right there, you know, uh, right behind, you know, in the midst of it. Within a week of this, he was right back doing his job building bridges, getting Patton's army uh, uh, to Berlin, racing the, the Russians to try to make it to Berlin. And then, then this line, I hope the plans that are being made now will prevent you two from seeing another war. What he's talking about is at this moment, my grandfather, her father, was with FDR at Yalta. Uh, and at Yalta, the big three, FDR, Stalin, and Churchill were all uh, trying to make plans for the end of the war. And that's what he's talking about. Uh, I know all the troops here now will do all they can to keep going in the right way. Say some prayers for all that's with love press. And so it's when this letter came in the mail a couple of days, like second week of May, that they realized that he was alive and well. Um, and what they didn't know is by then, he was already in the process of being shifted back to the United States to head to California, right, to get ready for deployment in Japan, you know, for the invasion of Japan that fortunately never happened. Well, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's Press's story. Yeah. Um, well, um, we're, we're a little over an hour in now, Larissa. You want to open up for questions? Sure. Um, yeah. Do you want to close your uh, screen there so maybe then we can see everybody? Do I? Oh, close my screen. So yeah. You mean get rid of that? Yeah. And let's see. Is that better? Yeah. Let me. Do you want me to get rid of sharing? Yeah. Try How that. How would I do that? Let's see. Well, I'll go back to being the presenter. There you go. That'll do. Yeah. Okay, so now we can see everybody, right? Okay. So, but I do have two questions in the chat here and I'll read those, uh, that one first and then the other one has a comment and I'll, I'll yeah, unmute everybody. So, okay. um, uh, the, pers the person that just comes up is a laptop. <laughs> has a, a question. Did you teach Carolyn how to play the piano? Did you teach Carolyn how to play the piano? Yeah, we both, I don't know. Well, I took lessons and then I would uh, show her how to do it. Also, when I went to the White House, I showed Sissy how to do it. We had a, they had a, a beautiful baby grand piano in the East Room that was, I thought it was made of gold. Of course, it was wood and it was painted gold, but to me, it was a gold piano. And I often wonder what happened to the thing. But yes, I did. So you had a piano at 206 Baltimore yeah, Road? Yeah, I had a piano at 206 Baltimore Road that belonged to my great grandfather. Oh. It was a beautiful, oh, the wood and it was gorgeous. I look at now, of course, it didn't mean anything to me then, but. That's what we did. Good question, laptop. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to unmute you, Kathy, and you can uh, say what you wanted to say there. Hold on. Kathy's going to ask you a question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Hi, Mrs. Newman. Um, I just wanted to thank you. I read the book very recently, and I had a... Um, <clears throat> a Skype call. My own mother is in assisted living. She's 91. And I told her the story about uh, the grocer who had the signs that said, put your fat can on the counter. <laughs> and we had a good laugh and uh, talked a lot then about her memories of World War II. So just wanted to thank you so much for that. Well, you're quite welcome. Um, where did your mother live at when she was a child? Uh, in Pitts, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, I think it, there were some things that were different than living what where I did right on the East Coast. Because one thing, I don't know if I put, had it in the book or not, but we had blackouts every single night. And I think in other places in the country, they didn't have to because they weren't right on the coast right. like we. I know they did in California and up, you know, Oregon and Washington State, but uh, in the middle of the country, they didn't. But it was different. 
but there were so many things that were the yeah. same. What mm -hmm. Kathy's referring to, the, those of you who haven't read the book and don't know this story, um, fat was collected, leftover drippings was collected for the drip for the glycerin in order to make explosives. And and so at the butcher shop, they would collect your can you would collect your can of fat all week long, put your drippings in, you take it and you turn it over, and the butcher would give it to the government, and the government would make bombs. And so the sign on the counter said, ladies, because it was ladies who were shopping. Yeah. Said, ladies please put your fat cans here <laughs> and my <laughs> uncle thought that was hilarious and every time he went, he that, out. And that was always a big joke okay so we Thank have you, um, let's see all right so we have we have another one. Oh, and last up is claudette so um she put her name there uh, do you have any stories about Percy's brother Raymond? A little louder. Do you have any stories about Percy's brother Raymond? Raymond. Oh, yeah. Raymond, yeah. <laughs> uh, Raymond had a car because he worked at uh, Reed Brothers, which was, a, I guess, at the time, the only car dealer mm -hmm. in. Uh, Bronco, and I think at the time they sold Dodge cars. Yeah. But I don't know if there was any other, but I can remember the Dodge. But sometimes when my father was at the White House and couldn't come home in the morning to go get Car um, Percy and Caroline, if they were coming to, well, Percy came every day, but if Daddy couldn't get to Percy, uh, Raymond would bring him, and I can remember seeing him outside and, you know, in the car, and uh, that's another thing that was weird, but I didn't say anything in the book, book about it. Most Black people, which we called colored people then, <laughs> did not have cars, yeah. so that was a plus for them to have yeah. a car. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I, a big advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And um I can remember the Reed Brothers um the garage was right across the street from St. Mary's Church from where we went and was not far from where I lived. And um I can remember seeing him over there and I can also remember him helping me. Um we used to have drives for metal and rubber and all sorts of things and uh and used um uh, oil came out of cars and i can remember when it was my turn at school to do the friday listing thing i used to call and i think um raymond had a, a phone and percy i know they did had a phone at home Anyway, um, I can remember calling and talking to him and asking him to save stuff for me because it was my Friday to go and pick up stuff that we saved and whatever. But that was what I remember of him. Okay, so um, we have a question from uh, Joe and the question is, was Sarah Roosevelt as mean as she is often portrayed? Was Sarah as mean as she is yeah. often portrayed? Yes. <laughs> to me, she was. <laughs> Not I to mean, you. Well, to me, she was mean to her grandchildren. Right. I never understood that when she was never that way with me. Lord, she'd spank them and throw things at them and yell at them. And she, well, she never did that to me. What if, tell, tell them about the 1940, actually 41, presidential inauguration. Can you sit with her in the reviewing stand? I sat on the um, sat on her lap. Yeah, I sat on her the <laughs> There was a picture on one time, I don't know if you remember it, a long time ago, you saw on TV, yeah. that thing came up and you said, yeah, yeah, oh, there. there's the mom. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll watch uh, the History Channel for things and I'll see my grandfather or I'll see her 
pop up whenever they cover the White House. Yeah, and, and I said, yes, that daggone green snowsuit. I hated that thing. It was wool and it itched. <laughs> so she was cranky with her own family, but she was, yeah. I mean, she's the one that came out to yeah. Rockville and brought a oh, doll yeah. that she sewed for you when you were so sick, yeah. you know, cared yeah. for you so much. Yeah. Yeah, well, she was always uh, nice and good, but she was, gave her two grandchildren a fit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what she did with any of the others, but I think they were probably the only ones that she had before she died. Mm. She died while uh, uh, Franklin was uh, president. Yeah. She died at the White House. Okay. All right, we have uh, one from Claire. Um, she says, my husband was a boy in Kansas during the war, and he told me many stories uh, similar to yours. I guess that's just more of a statement. Oh, just a comment. <laughs> just a comment. Yeah. Just a comment. Okay. Um, her husband was a boy in Kansas during the war, oh. and had many similar stories in oh. Kansas as your stories in Maryland. Yeah. What thing I would love to um, have people read, people that were are my age now and remember all those things and how you know, different it was or the same, you know? But I like to have children, 12 year olds, middle school age children read it. And I know they'd laugh the whole time. They'd think it was funny as all, yeah. but it really wasn't funny for us. It was scary, very frightening for us. Because yeah. I grew up thinking I was going to end up speaking Japanese, yeah. not thinking that it would be the Germans that would be here to yeah. get me. Much well. more likely. Yeah, yeah. much more much likely. More likely. And, uh, but the well. things that we had to do uh, as children in school, we had to learn uh, English, I mean, uh, German words and Japanese words, and we had to know all the insignias on the uniforms of the Japanese and German uh, officers. So we know what like the general was in their language and whatever, and what we should do and Airplane how we- identification, yeah, how, the bombers. Yeah, you know. how we would answer people that would ask, and that was frightening to children. And, um, but we kept on doing it and whatever, and. I got to be in the Civil Air Patrol, CAP, which I don't know if they have it now or not. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, but anyhow, we had a small air, airport um, where I lived in Rockville. And one of my jobs was to go on, I think it was Tuesdays that I had the CAP duty, mm -hmm. with a notebook that had um, block like silhouettes of German and Japanese planes. And if we saw one, we had to mark it and then go to the hangar where um, there was a service man there. I don't remember what, what kind he was, but tell him, and I don't know what they did from there, but anyway, they had, our airport also had a um, search flight, as we call it. And that would be going on all night long, every night, right, sweeping the sky, looking for planes and whatever. But that was where I did my uh, CAP duty. Mm. Never, never saw a Japanese plane or a German plane, which was a big disappointment to me, but <laughs> whatever. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So we just have a comment from uh, Jackie. She just says thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Thomas. Uh, Thomas wants to know um, any stories of Minnie and Harry Waters. Minnie and Harry Waters. <laughs> Minnie and Harry Waters. Now Minnie was um, uh, Percy's boat right that's what you're talking yes. about yeah yes. uh, all yes. i knew about minnie and her who did you say harry, harry? 
I don't remember ever seeing him. I remember seeing many. Mm -hmm. but oh. any, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Anyhow. Uh, all I can remember is she worked at home and she took in, as they say, took in laundry. Mm -hmm. And she did other people's laundry. Yep. And sometimes, every once in a while, um, and I think it was spring house cleaning and fall house cleaning, she would do my mother's curtains because Percy was busy doing everything else during the spring house cleaning. And her mother would uh, uh, wash the curtains. And she had, I remember going to their house and I remember her seeing her have this wooden thing frame that somebody built and it had like nails all over it. And that's where they had put the wet, she would put the wet curtains on to dry. I don't know what the story on that was, but they were, and they looked like they were starched. So she must have starched them and stretched then them out. stretched them out. Yeah, probably stretched them out. Oh, that's laughing. What are you well, doing? You know what I'm talking about? Huh? Um, yeah, kind of. Can I yeah. give a 30 second update on Percy and Carolyn? Yeah, let her do it. Go, Jackie. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Percy, Percy was my grandmother, and Carolyn was my mom, as it was my yeah. sister Claudette. She's the one on the laptop. Joseph yeah. is my brother. That um, Percy was our grandmother, and our um, Carolyn was our mom. And the one Thomas Crowley is oh, right there. Oh, right there. Raymond's daughter, Minnie. So we all kind mm -hmm. of, you know, came here tonight, you know, to just, you know, <laughs> read this. And I just wanted to say that this book, <laughs> this one right here, if you can see it. Can't hear you. Oh, we can't hear you. Lost was Jackie. incredibly um, yeah. touching for for Carolyn's children to read. My mom, my parents had seven children. Oh, my, my parents had seven children. Um, and this was incredibly um, touching to read about this. We always think about my mom's childhood and, and my brother and all that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, um, it was, it was, it was a tearjerker. Yeah. It was a tearjerker for us, you know, in a, in a oh, lot of ways. And um, we felt really connected because my mom passed away. My mom passed away four years ago. Yeah. And Percy I passed see. away in 1994. Yeah. So, yeah, this was really good. And it was actually Facebook that brought me and Paul and Miss Peggy together mm -hmm. by chance. It was on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably one of the one of the neatest blessings of this book is making these connections. You know, I've so much enjoyed um, both Jackie and Claudette's posts on Facebook about their memories about Rockville and about their family, and it just has added so much context for me to the town I grew up in and the history that I know, um, mm -hmm. and to be able to put faces to these stories, even though they're the grandchildren of these faces. So it's like my generation, Jack and Claude Evan are all the you know, same generation. It's just really, yeah. that's been a real joy for us too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. My, my mother, I was wondering how my mother, she always played the piano. I never knew how she learned. Yeah, well. huh. I must have done a good job. Huh? <laughs> yeah. We start now. Yeah, I didn't know that story. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, another question. Um, for Joe, he says, uh, "Do you have your father's draft copy of the Yalta Agreement uh, given to him by FDR?" No, you don't. You know why? I have it. <laughs> I took charge of that about 25 years ago. Yeah, you <laughs> I use it in class all the time. I show it to students. Yeah, I don't show it to Joe, though. I never show it to him. Yeah, he'd steal it. 
<laughs> How in 20 years have I never seen this, Paul? Oh, you have. I've showed it to you. It's in my office. Oh. All you got was a signed photograph of John F. Kennedy. I don't want to hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was something that I did talk about John. Uh, real, real quick, just to introduce everybody. That's Joe Hefley. He's the worst college student I ever experienced in 25 <laughs> years of teaching. But he was my best man at my wedding, so we, we led him on to things like this. <laughs> again, again, Mrs. Newman, can you smack him for me? <laughs> he has to smack me for him. Yeah, I'll do it. She'll get it later. <laughs> He'll have to go out and uh, pull a switch. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, uh, John Kennedy, um, I don't know how it happened, but um, my father was went to um, uh, the White House. I guess it was the last time he was there, because he had already retired, of course. But anyhow, um, he went to represent the Secret Service at uh, the viewing of Kennedy when he was um, oh. laid in state at the White House. And I took him. Um, he was in a wheelchair. My father was in a wheelchair at the time. And um, that was a hard day for him and for me too, really, because it was the last time that I was in the White House, but it didn't go and for the places that I mm. played and loved, and uh, of course that day, but... Um, no, you were in the White House again. Well, you were in the White House again in 1972. You you were a parent with Mrs. Towers' uh, nursery oh, school class, oh, yeah. and took us all there to meet Richard Nixon. Yeah. <laughs> all the... I was four years old. That was my first trip to the White House. Yeah. Wow. But whatever, but that's when I uh, went to Daddy <laughs> the first time he was there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't let Joe ask any more questions. That's enough. I'm <laughs> done. I got two in. I'm done. What about Pam Weaver? What are your questions, honey? Do you have any questions? No, I've, I've heard a lot of the stories over the years, and I've always enjoyed them. And... <laughs> You know, it's kind of fun to read the book and say, oh, yeah, that's that's, you know, I remember that story and, and stuff. So it's it's really fun to hear all the other people's reaction um, yeah. to, to the book. Uh, Preston was my father in law. That's my connection to the family. I was married to one of his uh, children. So my my favorite, right? <laughs> Your favorite, huh? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I've been around. It's my favorite. But I don't think any of the others are there, so they won't yeah. know. That's right. Those of you who don't know, never... Press ended up, um, Press and Gitch had 17? 16. 16, 16. I'm sorry. I said 16 children, 14 after the war. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had two, and they had to take two years off, two years off for the war, and they made up for lost time. <laughs> they had 16 children, 10 boys, and which is one of them as uh, Pam's husband. And... Uh, Ten boys and six girls. Yeah. That I keep in contact with all of them. Don't I, Pam? There's. A, uh, say I, again. I say I keep in contact with all of them. Yeah. Hey, has a. She's in charge of the birthday list, which you can imagine. Yeah. Seen children and their children and their grandchildren. I don't know how many people there are. It's probably like 150. There's over 200 now. Pardon? There's over 200 people. Okay, well, I've lost count. And every day in Facebook, it's the birthday alert, so. Yeah. And then somebody, the, the new ones that are born. Yep. We just had a new one this past week. We did, we did. <laughs> I don't know. It's quite a force. Yeah. Wonderful family. So, um, do you want to, oh, sorry. Do you want to just uh, have one? One more question. One more is good. She needs to eat dinner. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I so, want to make a quick, quick remark in the uh, small world. You teach at University of Pittsburgh in Johnstown. Yes. He is a, uh, Tom Crowley is a son of Johnstown. Yes. Oh. Grew up in Johnstown, and uh, 
when you're out there sometimes, look around to all the different scholarships you've been given. There is one given in the name of my late father. Uh, he was on the board trustee for a while, Thomas M. Crowley. And um, so there's a connection. Yeah. Oh, wow. What neighborhood did you grow up in? I grew up in Upper Yoder Township. I didn't grow up directly in Johnston. I grew up in Upper Yoder. Yeah, I, I live in Southmont. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Uh, my wife is sitting, Bethany is sitting in Southmont right now. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's a small world. Very small, yeah. Wow, that's cool. Well, thank you all for, for being involved in this tonight. And those of you who've read the book, thank you so much. Deanna Haddle, I want to recognize her right now. Deanna is part of the American Association of University Women, and, and her organization purchased 10 copies for the Johnstown Library, um, which people in Johnstown have the ability now to read. So uh, thank you, Deanna, very much. and and the uh, the, the chapter of the AAUW in Johnstown. And thank you all for being involved. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much. And thank um, you, Larissa, and, and the, the Cambria County Library. Um, thank you. We're really, really honored. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you, Paul and Margaret. We really appreciate it, and we love hearing your stories. And uh, yeah, our, the books are going to be used for our book kits, so uh, all of our book clubs in the district will be able to read them. And so I hope so, they will all enjoy it. So yeah, cool. oh, I'm sure from it and learn something from it. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll have great discussions. So we really ap appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us and hope to see you again sometime. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.